Hello, welcome to another Relisper, Relisper Extra. Um, we are, over the next few weeks, showing you the long interviews we did with experts on various subjects for Rich Herring's Meaning of Life. Uh, before they were subscribe only, but now they're going out for free because we're lovely people. If you want to help us make more podcasts, why not go to gofasterstrike.com slash badges. Buy a monthly badge. You get all kinds of benefits, like a secret channel with backstage interviews and an um, entry to a monthly draw. Uh, and also, it helps fund, fund the podcast. Um, and if you just want to do a one-off thing, you can just buy a badge, but monthly is better. If you want to buy some merchandise, go to gofasterstrike.com slash aotoma. Aotoma. Um, I'm nearly better. It's, it's been a long, old month of illness. I'm still on tour, uh, despite being not very well. Uh, here are my upcoming uh, tour dates uh, in the short term. I've just come off the page like a buffoon. <clears throat> I'm at the Forest Arts on the 1st of March. I think that might be sold out. It's nearly sold out as I speak. It might be sold out while you are here, uh, while you're listening. I'm at Worthing on the 2nd of March. That one's definitely not going to be sold out. So if you're in Worthing, come and see me. Uh, Fairham and Colchester also sold out. And then uh, Sunday, the 5th of March, Canterbury, 8th of March, Haywards Heath, 9th of March, Aldershot, again, nearly sold out. Uh, then Bath, Lancaster, Barton upon Humber, Liverpool. It goes on. Go to richherring.com slash the underscore best slash tour and you can see all of my tour dates. Uh, thanks to everyone who's come to see the show so far. It's been going really well. And um, that is a good thing. Um, apart from being ill, how old I look? When, when did I get this old? There's a light right above me. That's the. It's just that's reflecting off my still very brown hair. Oh my god! Why God? Why curse you for making me get old this way? Uh, anyway, sit back and enjoy this interview with Richard Wiseman and talking about the paranormal. It's a lot of fun. Hope you enjoy it. Bye. Richard Harris, now, will you please welcome to talk more about the paranormal, the fantastic Professor Richard Wiseman, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> welcome. Thank you for coming along. Love to see you. Thanks for coming along. Pleasure. Good. Um, and so uh, I've been reading your book. It's here, handily enough. Look, I'll hold that up to the camera. You might sell three copies of that as a result of this. I think you've probably sold more than three already. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very good book. It's very good. Uh, I've very much enjoyed it. I've read it twice. Uh, paranormality, why we see what isn't there. So you're going to explain to me the science behind uh, the paranormal. Uh, but I want to take you through a few of uh, some things, that paranormal things that have happened to me that I think are inexplicable. And I want to see if you can explain them. When I was on tour uh, a few years ago in the 90s uh, with Stuart Lee and Richard Thomas, mm. uh, we... Um, making up your own jokes now. <laughs> Richard Thomas, actually, you, know, you are laughing. It just reminded me, Richard Thomas did one of the funniest things ever on that tour that I had forgotten about until this second, uh, where uh, he... I'd put a Do Not Disturb sign on my door and uh, he... he uh, I think he flipped it around. It was the breakfast menu on the other side. He ticked every single thing on the breakfast menu. <laughs> so the next morning, literally, and they came, and two people came, yeah. both to carry it and to look at the greediest man yeah. in the world. That's funny, yes. And I had, I had a full, double full English breakfast, and I was vegetarian at the time, so yeah. it was doubly amusing. Is, is that the, the paranormal experience you wanted explaining? No, that is that's an easy bowl. No, uh, that's, just a, that's just by the by. Okay. Uh, when I was on that tour, we, we were young and we got drunk quite a lot and I was quite tired. We didn't sleep very much, I have to say. And I went, uh, I think it might have been in Guildford, I went to sleep on the dressing room floor and, uh, and then I woke up, I thought, and on my chest there was an old woman, I thought it was Richard Thomas for a moment, <laughs> the writer of Jerry Spring of the Opera, but it was an old woman sitting on my chest right. uh, and, uh, str and strangling me. Mm -hmm. And I kind of had to fight her off, and then she disappeared. Yeah. How, explain that with your science. Well, um, if you are backstage, and it's an area that old women can get access to, <laughs> if she's seen you work before and hasn't yeah. enjoyed the show, <laughs> yeah. she maybe thinks, there he is asleep. <laughs> I'll go and sit on his chest and strangle him. Well, it could be. That is a good explanation, actually. Well done. But she did sort of disappear the minute I uh, officially woke up. Yeah. So is, would it... I haven't got a clue. You haven't got a clue? I, I, <laughs> you, would, you would want uh, an expert uh, really? on, on paranormal experiences. I, I think what, what, you, what you probably experienced was not an actual 
old woman. No, I, think, I don't think it was. The disappearance would be a clue. Yeah. Um, was the fact that I was asleep a clue as well, do you think? <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, it, it's what we psychologists um, would call uh, unusual. <laughs> and uh, it, it's uh, probably a night terror yeah. uh, come sleep paralysis. Uh, and so what's happening is when you fall asleep, when you dream, uh, you actually are paralyzed, so you don't act out your dream. And some people don't, they actually do act out their dreams, mm -hmm. and that's quite funny. Um, <laughs> but they, they also remove themselves from the gene pool uh, fairly rapidly uh, for, <laughs> for doing that. Um, so... Um, so anyway, so you're paralysed, and then when you come to, as it were, you start to regain consciousness. I didn't come. I didn't come to. A little bit. <laughs> she definitely came. That's why I thought it <laughs> when you come to. Um, when you regain consciousness. Yeah. Uh, after having ejaculated. Um, <laughs> actually, during dreams, of course, you have an erection. Not, no, not just yeah. you. <laughs> not just you, everyone. Nice uh, well, not everyone. Them, uh, nice men. I get them some of the time. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, so both men and women are sexually aroused um, during dreams. Well, they're not actually. Um, they are, their genitalia um, is, is aroused. Okay. Uh, they are. Um, they might <laughs> that be sexually. That is part of them, though, right? That isn't like a... You're telling me a genitalia is like a creature that lives on a... <laughs> And when we're asleep, it comes alive and... Yes. This is terrible. I never thought we'd get to this. Not this quickly. <laughs> there's lots of sort of detached genitalia running around having sex with each other whilst we sleep. I saw a film on the internet once about a woman who had a genitalia that lived on her and it kind of ate people, but very slowly. And they went, oh, oh, I was... Ah. <laughs> I was... Talking. Yes, I... About the penis mm -hmm. and the vagina. And I use the term genitalia as a collective noun. Okay. Um, <laughs> by <laughs> I'm now regretting it, to be honest. I, I wish I hadn't mentioned the entire sexual arousal, because it's not even important to the story. I, I was just throwing it in the whim. Uh, so anyway. Um, uh, so yes, so there you are, um, sexually aroused and uh, paralysed. You start to regain consciousness. Yeah. And you think, well, I can't move. That's a bit weird. And then your brain, as it often does, makes up a story to tell you to explain the paralysis. Uh, and it tells you there's somebody pinning you down. And it depends on your belief system as to what you think that is. Some people think uh, it's like the devil. Uh, some think it's an alien. Uh, and, and for some reason, your brain decided to come up uh, with an old woman. Yeah. Uh, which is a curious choice. That's, that's, you, you, it could have come up with anything. It could have come up with, you know, an attractive young woman. Yeah. But oh no. <laughs> I'm the only gerontophile in show business. That's, uh... <laughs> and that makes me safe. I'm safe. Um, <laughs> um, and then uh, what happens? It's quite, it's quite a scary experience, actually. So, so as, uh, and, and then you, you slowly drift into proper consciousness, and you realise there's not an old woman there, uh, and so your brain makes her disappear, and, and then you're, you're fine. Um, but the thing to do, if you have it again, is try and wiggle your toes, because that breaks the paralysis quite quickly, and then and the, and the uh, drift through consciousness is much faster. I wanted, I wanted to go. I wanted to stay. It's, the, it's, not, it's nice having a friend on that tour. Uh, just, just for one second. Uh, that's quite interesting. I also had uh, lucid dreaming once, which was terrific, but I was sort of punished for this lucid dreaming. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did, I did better in my lucid dream. I realised I was... Uh, this is where you can control your dreams. This is quite an exciting thing. You're asleep, but you realise you're asleep, but you don't wake up. And then you can... This is something you can train yourself to do a little bit. Yeah, you have to be careful because yeah. um, you, you think you are... Well, you're aware that you're dreaming and yeah. therefore you can control your dreams. But, but for some people, it's so realistic that when they're awake, they think they're in a dream. Well, this is the problem I had with it. I have to... Honestly, it was so frightening. I, I, I was in my flat and I said, right, I, I know I'm asleep. I'm going to go into my bedroom and there'll be two women in bed. And I went in, there were three women in bed. It was even better than I'd imagine. <laughs> And then uh, you I started, were in somebody else's bedroom, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I thought, oh, and I got into bed, but then I think I fell out of bed in the dream, and that woke me up. I thought, right. But then I went about my day, yep. and then I realised I spotted something that wasn't right, and then I realised I was asleep, 
and then I, I, I and I woke up again. But then I and every time I, I woke up about eight or nine times in the dream. So you had eight or nine false awakenings yeah, yeah. within the dream. And and one of them, I just looked around the room and I was thinking, am I really awake this time? And uh, and then I saw like a joss stick burning in my room, and I thought, well, like that's not my room. <laughs> that was that's all I could say. So then I woke up, and then I thought, I was in the dream, I thought, I'm never going to wake up. This is it. I'm stuck in this dream. I'm never going to wake up. How am I going to get out of the dream? And then my alarm went off, and I thought woke me up. But then what if it didn't wake me? What if I'm still in the dream? And that week was the week that I met Julie Swala, and then she said she wanted to go out with me. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I'm still asleep. And maybe I'm just living out this dream, and I'm going to wake up, and I'm going to still be back in that room in Balham. Could that happen? Um, Has well, anyone ever had that something that's a lucid dream that's gone on that long and false uh, awakening? They have, but they've been sectioned shortly afterwards. <laughs> so um, it's that's a lot. That's a lot of false yeah. awakenings for, for. There was all sorts of stuff, and there were one bit of it, and I've just remembered there was a bit where Mark, I met Mark Lamar outside my house, and we went to a we went to a swimming pool and watched some a swimming tournament during this is one of the dreams, <laughs> and it wasn't lucid dreaming at this point. This isn't what, this isn't what I wanted to happen, and then. We were sitting on raked... Um, usually people's dreams are quite boring. Like, this is pretty fucking amazing, this dream. We were sitting on raked seating, and then there were all the lifeguards turned into sort of Nazi guards, and the pool became electrified, and the seats all started lifting up, <laughs> and we started falling into the pool, and I fell into the pool, and, you know, usually if you die in a dream, you wake up. I died, and I didn't wake up for a bit, and then I woke up. But it was, I actually managed to die in the dream. It was terrifying. That's very unusual. Yeah. Um, well, great. had you been consuming what I would refer to as drugs? No, I, hadn't. I thought you were going to say, had you been consuming a lot of cheese? And I said, is this your psychologist? Yeah, eating a lot. Had you eaten like three different cheeses before? That, would, that's, that explains that. I hadn't, I don't, I, I was probably drinking quite heavily. Ah, there you go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yes, you were, you were drinking quite heavily, would be my guess. And the, if we can edit out before that, the comment that you say that, because then I'll look really accurate in terms <laughs> okay. of a we'll diagnosis. Yes. We definitely will do that. Good. Um, I think you were, you were probably drinking, um, and, but it is unusual to have false awakenings and dreaming of, of your own death, because normally you can't dream about experiences you haven't, uh, at least you couldn't imagine right. very, very easily. Um, the thing to do if it happens again, a yeah. little hint and tip here, uh, first of all, have nothing to do with Mark Lamar, yeah, even I think in the, the... That was the clue that he was being really friendly. You know, that was... <laughs> Uh, and the other two things you can do in, in lucid dreaming uh, is try and turn on the lights because normally that breaks the lucid dream. It's very hard to alter illumination levels. And the second thing is, best thing to do actually, look in the mirror. Right. Because you can't. Ooh. You can't. <laughs> Why do you go, ugh? Because he thinks if you look in the mirror, then something terrible is going to happen, right? Someone's going to come out and grab you. That's definitely what would happen. It would, that Candyman. Um, yeah. Well, uh, it's not. It's. Uh, <laughs> What happens is that your brain tries to construct your own reflection, which is really hard to do, and it breaks the uh, lucid dreaming quite rapidly. Right. So there we are. <laughs> Tips and hints. It's good. Well, it's good to know. I don't, I, I was, I'd like to lucid dream again. That was about the only time it ever happened to me. It was very, worth, very hard to do. It was worth it, but I'm still worried that I'm still in that dream because, you know, my life's gone so impossibly well. <laughs> 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 and have I got another? There was some... There was, oh, there, can you explain this? Then we'll get on to some proper questions. Mm. Uh, when I was about um, 23, 24, I was in a supermarket uh, and I was just sort of looking at some... I, was, I think I was just sort of standing by the freezer uh, and there was, like, shelves behind me. And then a man started walking towards me, pointing at me, and he went, herring, and this is before anyone knew who I was, herring, 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 and he was mumbling, herring, and he was pointing at me. And, I was going, and he, re he came up to me, reached towards me, and he reached right by my ear and then took a tin of herring off the, <laughs> off the shelves... That is impossible. That is that's, there's statistically impossible that could happen. That, that's amazing. It yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah, the weird thing. <laughs> there's, I, didn't, I didn't notice a chapter on that in your book, so uh, I no, I'd ask. No, no. Um, so if you're a psychologist, you yeah. go to a party, and someone finds out you're a psychologist, yeah. they, uh, what they do is they say, oh, there's a couple of things they say. One is, uh, oh, you, you must be sort of reading my thoughts yeah. uh, thing, and you, you think, I'm not. A psychic and a psychologist, <laughs> and then they they um, they kind of go, oh, uh, could you you know could you help analyse this particular problem? And, uh, which is very very bizarre because you think, well, if you meet a builder at a party, you don't kind of go, well, could you put up an internal wall um, while you're here? <laughs> and and also it suggests that I give a fuck um, <laughs> about them. 
uh, which I don't. Uh, and, and, and psychologists don't. It's, it, they get paid to care. Uh, that, that's, that's why they do it. And then, uh, so you then explain, I explain, I'm a parapsychologist, and I'm nothing to do with uh, clinical stuff, as you might imagine, from <laughs> my, my demeanour. Uh, and, um, and then Does that mean you're flown in and dropped yeah. into areas yeah. where... Yeah. <laughs> if, there's a, if there's a major accident, <laughs> uh, like a car accident, I'm flown in, and, I, and, and the, the person's laying there, and I say, and, and how do you feel about that? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's remarkable. Um, so no, and so explain what that is. And then they start telling me their paranormal experiences. And they are, they're not as good as your paranormal no, experiences. Great, Yours were, were A-grade paranormal <laughs> experiences. Normally it's, oh, then you'll be interested in this. <laughs> and you go, oh, for fuck's sake. I, they, I, I, and then you're trapped at this party with this person. Um, normally a woman, actually. Normally a woman. The guys don't do this so much. Normally a woman. Kind of going, oh, it's really odd. And they go, it's this enormously lengthy story. And you sort of zone out halfway through. Zone in at the end and go, oh, that's really interesting. How did that make you feel? Um, <laughs> and walk off. That's, that's my life at parties. How does that make you feel? That's right. <laughs> so, um, have you ever seen a Bigfoot? I don't do monsters. No. No, I, I've, I've well, always... it's not like you get the choice. If a Bigfoot comes up to you, you're not, it can't, you can't just ignore it. You have to look at it. No. I, as an academic, you have your niche. <laughs> okay. And if a monster were to approach me, I would say, I don't do monsters. Right, okay. Um, and, and that would be that. I don't do monsters, uh, and I don't do UFOs. Okay. So I, I've, I've done psychics, uh, I've done mediums, uh, and, and all sorts of weird things, but, but, but not UFOs and, and Bigfoot. Have you ever... This is, these are my two Leicester Square Theatre questions. Yeah. Have you ever seen a ghost? No. Oh. Um, in but you've part, investigated I've investigated that... lots, and I've spent many a night in a haunted house. I haven't seen one, um, in part because they don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> and the people that claim to have seen them are, are liars um, <laughs> or mad so what, one of those those two I, 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 um, uh, I've been to lots of haunted houses um, I've never seen anything I think even slightly odd um, <laughs> or weird um, I've never I've got so a genitalia you might be interested in <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, we, went, we uh, did an investigation at Hampton Court Palace yeah. and uh, so they phoned us up and they said lots of people are having weird experiences uh, in a part of the palace which is called the Haunted Gallery and I thought <laughs> <laughs> no, no suggestion there then <laughs> and uh, so the, the team and I turned up for, for 10 days in the Haunted Gallery and we gave these little public talks uh, about uh, the, the haunting which was um, because they're allegedly uh, Henry VIII had chopped off the head of Catherine Howard and she'd come back to haunt uh, in the, the gallery. Where well, you would. You would. You would, yes. If you could, you would. Yeah. Um, and then on day two, we were joined by a woman, and she was this woman was criticising my history when they are doing on the talks, but from a first-person perspective. <laughs> so she was saying, I wasn't dragged up the gallery, I was dragged down the gallery. And I was saying, what are you talking about? And she, she was the reincarnation of Catherine Howard. Wow. Yeah. And she stayed with us uh, for ten fucking days. <laughs> And she was invaluable uh, in absolutely no way at all. Um, you simply wanted her to leave. You but could have said, have you ever come back here as a ghost? And then if she said no, then you could have shut, shut she down the investigation. Down, yes. That's right. No, I've That's just come over. back here as a reincarnation. Don't be ridiculous. I would never be a ghost of um, a reincarnation. She's very annoying, very annoying. Um, <laughs> And because there was that great study, it was a psychiatric study, it wasn't a, a paranormal study, where they got all the people, a lot of psychiatric patients that believed they were Jesus and put them all in the same room together. Right. <laughs> and just... <laughs> <laughs> just filmed them arguing. Um, <laughs> and what I like is it had no therapeutic value at all. It was... <laughs> we're just bored. Get all the Jesuses down. <laughs> Stick them in the room. So uh, they, all, I, they all forgave each other, I hope. That would be the I, best. That, I think, <laughs> if my memory serves me, I think that one decided to be Jesus on Monday and the other would say Tuesday and they agreed amongst themselves what day they would be Jesus. I, I think that was the end point um, of it. So anyway, sorry, I digress. No, good. So, and one of the things you saw at Hampton Court was there was you set up a, uh, a scanner which could detect 
different body heats and yes. heats. And then yes. we did something did appear in six o'clock in the morning. Uh, it did. Um, so we, we had these scanners, uh, very, very sophisticated uh, heat scanners um, that were brilliant uh, for doing magic tricks with, actually, because you could do this trick. We'd have three chairs. You'd say to somebody, go and sit in the chair and come off again, and you wouldn't see that. And then you put the heat scanner on, and you could tell which chair they'd sat in just from the heat of their arse right. um, on the thing. It's very good. That was the best use of it. Uh, <laughs> 60,000 quid, well spent. Uh, <laughs> Um, so anyway, uh, yes, so that's right. So we set up the scanner, and then every morning we come in and look at the heat sensors, and there was nothing happening, nothing happening. And then one morning, the heat sensors were showing something about six in the morning, and there's no um, security at that point. So we, we looked through the, uh, heat, the actual videotape from the uh, heat sensor, and we saw a figure, a ghostly figure, come through the door. And the Catherine Howard reincarnation recognized the figure as a member of her court. So that's how we knew uh, there was nothing paranormal going on. <laughs> And then um, he uh, got out, the, the ghostly figure got out a vacuum cleaner and started <laughs> vacuuming. Um, so the whole thing was a, a waste of time, uh, to be, to a be honest. A very helpful ghost. Very helpful, you very know, nice if you're, ghost. If you're stuck for eternity on, and you're not allowed to go to heaven, you might as well do a bit of cleaning, why yep. not? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and you, there's some interesting stuff about... Uh, well, there's a lot of interesting stuff in this book. There's, there's things about... Um, the Victorians used to do a table uh, Ouija boards and moving, ta- putting their hands on tables, and the tables would start to move. Yeah. Uh, even though no one was moving it, they they claimed themselves. Yeah. Uh, so is that is that proof of table moving it's, ghosts? Well, <laughs> they've come uh, back to move ta- move furniture around. It is. No, it's not. No. Um, it's. Uh, but it is, it is great. I don't know if you, have you ever done a table turning session? No. It's, it's great. It's, you have to be um, very slightly drunk and you have to have uh, quite a light table. And then, well, sort of four or six of you sit around and you put your fingertips on the, the table very lightly. And after about 20 minutes, half an hour, it will start to move around. And it, 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 the thing shoots around the room. It's great. And basically, um, you, you use idiomotor action, what do you mean? It's unconscious movements. Uh, so, so when you uh, th- imagine your hand moving in a certain direction, unconsciously you push it in that direction. At some point, everyone's pushing in the same direction, just by chance initially, and that, that rocks the, the table over. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's great. You've done loads of seance stuff. My favorite seance thing is actually the darkroom seances, um, which we did um, about 20 years ago. Which we, because the Victorians had sort of manuals on how to do fake seances. And so in a darkroom seance, you have luminous tabs on objects and they move around the seance room. And according to the manuals, uh, it's simply a man creeps into the seance room with a long stick and <laughs> moves the objects. And I, I've got sort of background in magic and I thought, I'm not sure that wouldn't fool anyone. So we thought we'd reconstruct it. So we did it over in Clerkenwell in an under, uh, underground sort of prison, disused prison. And uh, we got these people in. And uh, they all sat around, total darkness, and the man with the stick came out, leant over, moved all the objects, but you get disoriented in the dark. And so when the medium, or there's an actor playing the part of the medium, put the lights back on, the group looked up, and there's a man holding a stick, feeling his way. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) And to his credit, to his credit, he turned to the group and went, ignore me. That was one of my favourite yeah. uh, seance, seance things. And then after the session, you found out the man with the stick had died 24 hours before. Yeah. That he was a ghost. Uh, so none of it... Because so, what's kind of quite weird about the paranormal is that people have these amazing powers and then use them to do quite mundane and pointless things. So they talk to the dead and find out the first letters of people's names, yeah. which seems a waste of that talent. Or they, you know, they have the power to bend metal and, and just wreck a load of forks. You know, yeah, you, you, could, you could do something you know, quite evil or amazing with that power, but... Well, they never predict the lottery. No. Well, that would be handy. Um, it wouldn't be that good, though, would it? Because if they were good at it, everyone would do the numbers and you would only win a pound. <laughs> you might win less than a pound. If someone said, here's the lottery numbers, everyone would put their money on those lottery numbers and you'd get less back than you actually put on. It would be a different lottery if <laughs> there was a, a reliable process, yeah. I agree. Uh, they don't do that. Um, they do do financial astrology. You know, financial astrology is great. It's where the astrologer looks at the birth date of a company and tells you when to invest in the company on the basis of astrological charts. <laughs> and about 10 years ago, we did an experiment where we got a five-year-old child who did her investments totally randomly, and then we compared her to a financial astrologer using all these charts and stuff. And the child outperformed the financial <laughs> astrologer. 
And at the press conference, we said to the financial astrologer, why did the child beat you? And she said, well, I've only just found out the child is actually a Pisces, and that's really lucky. <laughs> that's one of my favourite moments. <laughs> But I think a lot of these things, you might, you, know, you might as well go with fortune cookies, just go follow their advice. It's as good just stick with something. I think that's quite good. Just follow the advice of someone and just stick with it. You don't have to make any decisions. Yeah, or a friend. That would be yeah. uh, somebody but some of who's us got are... some sense of caring about you <laughs> might be uh, another one. Yes. Uh, and there's a quite an interesting... I'll go, I'll go into the slightly more serious aspect of this in a second. There's a... Um, I quite like the story about... Is it Jeff or Geff, the talking mongoose? There is a big debate... Um, about whether it is Jeff or Geff. Right. <laughs> Let's have that debate. Let's have that debate now. I think it's clearly Geff. <laughs> I, um, unfortunately, I'm with you on the Geff thing, oh, yeah, so yeah. It's, it's not going to be much of a debate. But there, there is another, there's another group of academics who believe it's Jeff. Yeah. Um, and it's sort but, of less sort of mystical, isn't it? Jeff. Yeah, I, that's why Jeff, I, the Jeff. talking man. Geff no, is like, oh, he could be. That could be real Geff. It sounds like he's from another dimension. Jeff. Yeah, I'm the talking mongoose. <laughs> My name's Jeff. Nice to meet you. That doesn't doesn't work for me. So that, that, that's very similar to my position uh, on it. And so, so we're of the Geff group. Yeah. Um, the, the Jeff people, they, they make me sick. They, <laughs> it, the, they come along and, uh, you know, you take something like a talking mongoose, which is interesting, and they call it Jeff. Um, I will have nothing to do with it. <laughs> so very much on the Geff front. Um, and, yeah, Geff was a talking mongoose uh, yep. from the... Oh, he wasn't. Uh, he, <laughs> he might have been. He it might was, have been. It's a mystery unsolved. It's never been solved. Well, it, it's not much of a mystery. It's um, <laughs> Isle of Man, yeah. 1930s. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, what happened? The, uh, there's a, a cottage in the middle of nowhere, and this family say they've got a talking mongoose that lives between the outer and inner walls of the cottage and runs around. And you really... So far, I'm with it. Yeah. So far, so good. Who hasn't? Got it, yeah. <laughs> uh, and you don't, you don't ever see the, the mongoose, uh, but he shouts through the wood panelling. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, word spreads from the Isle of Man uh, to London about the talking mongoose. And so Harry Price is uh, one of my heroes, a sort of psychical investigator, and uh, uh, Richard Lambert, uh, who was head of the BBC, actually, at the time, one of the all very senior in the BBC. Both of them uh, go over uh, to the Isle of Man, investigate, and the talking mongoose won't speak to them. Because they didn't believe enough in him. That's why you've got to believe in... <laughs> they were calling him Jeff. He's going, I'm not talking to them. So they come back and publish a book uh, on it, and then uh, I think Lambert was potentially going to be promoted and didn't get the promotion. Uh, he thought on the basis of the fact he'd just written a book about a talking mongoose. <laughs> uh, so he sued for libel and won a very large amount of money in the libel courts uh, over his book on the talking mongoose. True, it's not an interesting story, no, but a true one. <laughs> <laughs> it is. So what do you, who do you think was making... Geff speak if it wasn't a real mongoose? Uh, well, there was a no. lot of attention uh, on the teenage daughter. It's often teenagers. Poltergeist cases normally involve teenagers yeah. um, because uh, they're little shits. <laughs> <laughs> and they basically just fuck around. And then gullible adults go, well, it couldn't be my darling daughter or son. It must be a talking mongoose. Um, <laughs> They, they make that, uh, what the philosophers refer to as a, a leap of error. Um, and uh, so, um, uh, so, yes, I, I think it was meant to be the daughter throwing her voice uh, in a sort of vent-type way, mm. a bit like sort of Roger de Corsi and Nookie Bear, <laughs> <laughs> but more plausible. Uh, so, um, so, yes, I think that's what You <laughs> that's think it was, was that? Well, that's, no, that was, that's, I can sleep safely at night now. I'm worried yeah. about... I realised I, I just mongies. dated myself. By, when, I, when I thought of event, I thought of Roger Corsi and Lucky yeah. Bear. You did date yourself. Yeah, I know. That's what it shows. Is it mongoose or mon mongooses or mongeese? Uh, well, there's, there's a big debate about that. Yeah. The, <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, it's not really... I mean, I could just look in a dictionary, but now I've got you here. Um, <laughs> be interested to hear what you think. I, uh, a, gr a group of mongoose uh, would be... A, well, so you've got several mongoose, and you would say, look at those mongooses. Mongooses. <laughs> <laughs> You've covered your bases. <laughs> okay. You've covered your bases. Have we got any experts? What would it be? Group of mongoose. Mongai. Mongai, thank you. <laughs> Ricky Gervais in the audience there. So, um... <laughs> um well, let's get on to the, the more serious 
side of this because my, it is fairly easy to explain most of these things. I like in your book the way you you describe. I was talking about Nostradamus earlier on, but the way that uh, if people are predicting things through dreams or in you know in in ways that are quite vague, eventually so many people are dreaming or so many people are guessing that something will happen that will it just logically statistically makes sense if you keep it vague you'll probably hit it yeah. if if millions of people are dreaming about events someone will dream about a plane crashing the day before a plane crashes because we all dream about that all the time yeah so this is the law of large numbers you have about five dreams a night each one's about 20 minutes uh, long and you don't tend to remember them uh, unless an event happens the next day that then triggers the, the memory and you, do, you forget the other dreams and, and, and so on so that that's sort of what's happening with dream um, precognition. Um, I saw a poster, I was going to tell you this actually, uh, I saw a poster on the tube yesterday that's uh, for a Christian singles dating site. <laughs> Have you seen this? Is it very well known or something? And, and it says, uh, God, kn God knew you were going to read this. Yeah. <laughs> he was right, wasn't he? Well, he got that right, he's got you. But Take that, science. But this is the thing. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at it, and as a scientist, I'm going... Yeah, but you didn't mention it before now. <laughs> so you're only mentioning it once the prediction comes true. If, if I'd have got a letter that morning, and then it'd be a lot more interesting prediction. From God. Then from it would, God. Have been, it would have been less exciting a prediction. You'd be going, fuck, I got a letter from God this morning. <laughs> and he said, I'm going to see something on the underground. You know, you know, last time he spoke just 2,000 years ago, he had more to say. <laughs> so, so in terms of prediction, uh, that's not a good one. And no. the same way as the dream one is, isn't yeah. good. You do have to predict events um, before they happen uh, because afterwards it's, it's a piece of piss. <laughs> <laughs> but what is quite interesting in your book is, is the way that um, a lot of the, the, uh, the reasons for a lot of these paranormal ideas come from us not understanding how our brains are working or our brains working uh, before, our conscious, before we're conscious of them working. So... Can you sort of explain a bit about that? Because it's a little bit complex. But it, is, it is a bit complex. It gets into the issue about free will, um, which is always a, uh, a sort of hilarious topic uh, <laughs> to bring up at any dinner party. Um, so, so you had the mind-body problem, which dates back a few years. And the issue of the mind-body problem is, is whether mind is separate to body and, and, and including brain. So what produces you? Where are you? And, and that's kind of interesting. If you say to kids, you know, where are you? When you point to where you are, they, they sort to do that. And you go, you know, and then they can do that sometimes and, and stuff. So we sort of think, but where are we? You know, where are the and so the, the sort of modern day um, uh, explanation is that the brain produces the sense of you, that, that you have no causal activity at all. So, you, so your brain is totally in charge. It's a very complicated thing that's making every decision in your life and then producing the illusion that you are making that decision. And there's lots of evidence to support that. You put people in brain scanners, and you say, oh, give us any number between 1 and 10. And before they have made their decision and said it, you see brain activity. So the brain is happening way before the mind. And because a lot of paranormal phenomena, those two things are separated with the automatic writing, where the medium goes into a trance, or even the table tipping, it seems to be the brain is pushing the table in a way, or writing, but the sense of you isn't being told about it. And so you think the spirits are working through you. So there's this big sort of philosophical thing going on embedded within the, the weird paranormal stuff. So do we have any free will or, at all, do you think? Well, in a sense, we can't have. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because the, the brain is making the decisions for you. You can't have free will uh, in a mechanistic universe. <laughs> so did your brain make the decision for you to come on this show yeah. rather than you? Yeah. Uh, doesn't yeah, seem a very you, intelligent thing to do. No, no, no. <laughs> I was going to say, one of the two of us is going to get talking to tonight. Um, so, so uh, yeah, so that, that's, that's the argument, is the yeah. brain's behind everything. Because otherwise, mind stuff is influencing brain stuff, and we've got no model for that at all. So the real mystery is how the brain produces consciousness and the sense of you. And we have no idea, no idea at all how that is happening. Absolutely not a scooby uh, with it. So, so there, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of work to be done. And you can make your brain think that someone else's hand is your hand and, you know... Yeah. Um, and... <laughs> my lord. So yes. the, it's good to know these yeah. things, just for the future. For the, when it's they get around to me in 30 years' time. It's, um, so, so these are producing out-of-body experiences where you can do this when you get home. Um, you, uh, oh, actually, I should do my, I'll do my, my suggestion exercise. Okay. We'll find if we've got any suggestion. Um, do you want to do a quick, we'll do a quick exercise thing, if you, if you don't mind. Um, so uh, we'll try this. Uh, everyone put their hands out like this. Keeping your hands level. That's great. Very good. And uh, now, all you need to do uh, is close your eyes. Trust me on this. Close your eyes. 
And in your mind's eye, just imagine uh, a helium-filled balloon attached to a piece of string, and the end of the string is attached to the fingers of your uh, right hand. So your right hand being pulled up, up towards the ceiling. Don't actually consciously move your hands, but just imagine your right hand being t uh, tugged high, higher towards the ceiling. Now imagine some big, heavy books. They're attached to another piece of string that's on the fingers of your left hand. So your left hand being pulled down, down by the heavy books as your right hand goes up, up towards the ceiling. The right hand going up, the left hand going down. Allow that thought to go into your mind as much as you can. Feel those heavy books, the light balloon. And now open your eyes. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So there would have been... Um, So it's a, lovely, it's a lovely little exercise, um, and you can do it uh, to find out a lot about people. So if your uh, right hand was much higher than your left hand, uh, then you're very creative type, um, and uh, likely to have paranormal uh, experiences. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, and be psychotic. The, uh, if your hands were level, uh, then you're more down to earth. Uh, and not so uh, creative, and not so likely to, to see ghosts uh, and, uh, and so on. And if your left hand was higher than your right, um, then you're, you're really weird. Uh, <laughs> so it's uh, if you're out on a, a date or something, uh, or, or, or something, and uh, want to find out about someone as to whether or not how, how mad they are on the mad spectrum, um, you can just get them to close their eyes, do that, and you're away. And have a little feel while they've got their eyes closed. <laughs> Just like <laughs> run for it. Run for it. You see the hands going like that, you just run. <laughs> Springy or Jack? Oh, no, he hasn't been on yet. Um, so anyway, so that's, yeah, so that's a suggestibility test, and uh, it's very, very highly correlated with um, seeing ghosts and paranormal uh, experiences and so on. Oh, well, that was definitely me. Because it does feel, when you're writing, um, and especially when I was writing things like As It Occurs To Me, which I did very, very quickly... Um, and sometimes I go to bed, uh, we'd, we'd record them on the Monday night, sometimes i go to bed on the Sunday night and not really have written anything. And I'd wake up on the Monday and it wasn't like an elf had arrived and there was a script. But <laughs> I don't think, but sometimes it almost felt like it. Sometimes, you know, I'd go, oh, there's no way I'm going to write this script. And then within an hour or two, there'd be just a stream of stuff and it was all right. And it felt like someone else, it felt like it'd been projected into my brain. That's often. after you'd woken up. Yeah. So, so really what's possibly happening is you're going to bed thinking of certain thoughts and uh, during the, the third of your life that you're asleep, uh, all the brain is doing is turning off consciousness. It absolutely isn't dormant. It, in fact, in some ways, it's more active than when you're awake. And one of the things it's doing is working on those sorts of problems. So it's, it's a well-known creativity technique. You sleep on it, and in the morning, you wake up with the answer. So what's happening is, is that overnight, you know, your, your brain's racing through, and in the morning, where does all this stuff come from? And, and yeah. being who we are, we, we come up with, you know, some weird a elfy... A aliens and elves. Yeah, aliens and elves. I didn't leave out any to eat, uh, acorn cuts full of beer, though, so they... I was worried they wouldn't do it the next time. Because uh, <laughs> you've got to do that. My wife has a dream dictionary beside her bed. Mm. Do you mind me talking about this? Uh, and thinks... <laughs> and th do, but do dreams actually... Do they have significance and mean stuff? Or do they, are they just a load of sort of shit brain farts? <laughs> brain dumps, maybe. Yes. Um, well, uh, my, my new book out in March... Oh. Effortless. <laughs> um, is, uh, it's about sleep and dreaming. So I've spent a long time looking at the, the dream issue. And the, the Freudian approach, which is basically all of your worries and... and well, it's not really that. The Freudian approach is about you, your mind's like an iceberg and you're only conscious of the top bit. And in, any time you have a sexual aggressive thought, you suppress it. And then they bubble up in everyday life in Freudian slips. So we go to Freudian analysis and they do the silly word association. Don't go to Freudian analysis. So it's wasting your time. Um, <laughs> mad. Uh, so, uh, uh, or during dreams, the idea is those sexual ideas kind of crop up. Uh, and, and so you, you, the idea is you can read great meaning into people's dreams. And that's why Freudian uh, people ask you about your dreams. Um, psychologists now think, that actually, it's exactly what I said before, that, that, that your brain is working on things that make you feel anxious. About 80% of dreams are negative when you wake people up out of REM state, uh, which is sort of when they're most likely to be dreaming. You wake them up and uh, ask them to report a dream. And uh, so, so most uh, dreams are negative, I say about uh, 80%. Uh, around about 75% of dreams are in black and white. 
which is kind of a weird thing. You tend to remember the colour ones. And the main, main finding from that dream research is most dreams are really dull. <laughs> they are just like I was at the office, nothing was happening. Um, <laughs> so uh, the dream world is, is incredibly dull. Uh, that, that was the main finding. But when it isn't dull, when there is some sense of anxiety, it's normally related to your everyday life. So it's pretty straightforward to see, you know, what's, what's happening. You don't need to be a Freudian analyst. If someone says, you know, I, I work on my, my boss was killing me with a knife, you kind of think, well, I wonder what's going on there. Now, <laughs> you're a Freudian. We've got all the knife's a penis and... Because uh, <laughs> uh, they're like, they've got dirty minds. Uh, they, uh, so everything to a Freudian uh, analysis, uh, analyst is a, is a penis. Um, so... Um, so yeah, but, but, but most of the dream work now isn't about that, it's simply you just reflect on what that, that dream is. It probably in that sense has a meaning for you. The dream dictionary is no use at all because dreams have different meanings for different people. Get rid of the dream dictionary, but actually talking through if you had an anxious dream with your partner or whatever isn't oh, a bad no, thing. Oh no, don't say, let, let her have the dream dictionary. <laughs> and and <laughs> when, oh, oh, no. when you describe your dream oh, no. as long and as detailed as possible, that's the just, and, and if you can draw pictures or you can yeah. write it down, just keep it as long and as detailed. That's the best way forward. Good. She's, she's very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's, uh, we'll wrap it up, but do you think, is there anything from the paranormal that you are unable to explain? Um, no. Um, <laughs> but the argument of the book, uh, Paranormality, is that uh, even though it's not true, and in fact because it's not true, it's even more interesting. That it tells us really fascinating things, like the uh, mind-body issue, actually quite deep philosophical issues uh, uh, about what, what it is to be human, what it is to make connections between things uh, that, that uh, aren't actually properly connected and, and so on. So my argument is, no it's not, but that makes it even more fascinating. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Richard Wiseman, by his fantastic books. <laughs> Lovely stuff. Thank you very much. You can go. Thank you very much. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>